All right. So, uh, University of Minnesota Golden Gophers, uh, if you want, you can go ahead and share your slides and, uh, and get us going. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Yep. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Prisco, and I'm a cardiology fellow at the University of Minnesota. In my group with me today, we have Alex DePine, Weston Upchurch, Mayanna Anderson, who are all PhD uh, students in computational biology, and we have Alex Dayton, who's an internal medicine resident. Uh, the title of our presentation today is Development of Machine Learning Techniques to Provide an Accurate and Equitable Assessment of a Patient's Cardiovascular Risk Non-Invasively. Okay, so uh, before we get started with uh, our proposed solution, I just want to go through um, a, a semi-quantitative uh, graph on kind of the natural course of, of a generic cardiovascular disease. So we have kind of the relative disease intensity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And if untreated throughout time, uh, the disease will progress until it gets end stage. And um, what I've done here is I've divided into three groups. The first one is um, where there's no clinical disease at all. So, so this is a heart and this is a coronary artery. And um, the second you get one little speck of plaque on there, um, you start progressing along this line. Probably doesn't mean anything clinically at that point, um, but as kind of time goes on, you may develop some what we call subclinical disease, or what we're referring to as subclinical disease today, which where there is presence of the disease, but there is no symptoms. So the third phase is um, what we're gonna refer to as symptomatic disease or overt disease. So this is when patients start developing um, some sort of symptom. So in, in the case of uh, coronary artery disease, that, that symptom is chest pain. And typically what occurs at this point is, um, uh, we start treating the patient. And the goal is to make a diagnosis. So this would be the time point where we made the diagnosis. And we start giving the patients things to treat this disease and hopefully bend the curve um, to essentially improve outcomes. So the whole um, goal of what we're trying to do here is essentially move this time point back. So we could start treating clinic, uh, cardiovascular disease when it's in the subclinical um, phase and, and potentially never even get to the, the overt phase where patients are developing uh, symptoms. Um, unfortunately, this time point right here in general is um, kind of the best case scenario for how clinical medicine works um, these days. And sometimes we don't even hit that because of you know, a number of inherent biases and and et cetera, that we've already been talking about today. I'm just gonna go through a couple of them really quick because I know a lot of people have already hit on these including Professor Evans in the introduction. Um, but number one, this is a study and, and it's a little bit old, it's about 20 years old, but um, I think it still holds true today, but it looked at the difference between men and women that were, that were admitted with a diagnosis of a myocardial infarction and it compared um, who got aggressive or invasive treatment and who did not. And after adjusting for everything, they actually found out that women um, were not as aggressively treated and um, outcomes were worse. Uh, a similar study was also conducted that found a similar thing in, in non-whites. The third is um, there's also a socioeconomic axis bias. So, so uh, patients that are less well off than others, they, they don't even make it to the hospital to make that um, diagnosis. And this study actually found that a lot of patients have symptomatic disease um, and that there was a number of barriers for them even getting to the hospital. So um, the fourth problem also is, is what we're gonna try and leverage to um, use our, as our solution is that a lot of the technology we use in clinical medicine actually is quite dated. So I got this, this um, graph off of Wikipedia, but this is a, um, a representative blood pressure waveform. So um, right here in, in the, uh, the bottom uh, left is when the heart starts to beat. So the blood pressure goes up and then the heart relaxes and it comes back down. And what we actually 
report clinically is just these two, two values. So this is the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure. And essentially the rest of the information is ignored. Um, this is uh, Dr. Karatikov who actually um, helped, uh, he invented the way that we, we have the Karatikov sounds named after him, but this is how you auscultate somebody's blood pressure. And this is his original paper that he published that was uh, well over a hundred years old, but this is still the measurement we use today. Um, so the goal here is we're gonna identify those who are in the subclinical phase of cardiovascular disease and equitably target those candidates with early treatment. Um, so this is our model of the kind of the current clinical standard of care. I'm not gonna badmouth this too much, uh, mainly because I think it's, it's actually quite good, but I think we can do better. There's a number of things that we, we, we put all this information in about a specific patient, and it, it essentially tells us if they need to be on uh, uh, therapy for primary prevention. So a couple of things I just wanted to draw your attention to are things I've already hit on. But the, the last one I wanted to, to point out was this big one in the middle, is their cholesterol levels. So kind of the underlying assumption there is that these patients have made it to the, a clinic or a hospital to get a blood draw, and this has been measured. Um, in addition to having the antiquated um, blood pressure readings and, and only looking at you know, white, African-American, or other. So our pro proposed solution is to develop a machine learning technology that can be used independent of a physician's office visit that provides an equitable and accurate assessment of an individual's cardiovascular risk. So how are we going to do that? Um, so this is, uh, called, this is the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis or the MESA trial. And, and this is the, we're gonna use data from this trial to, to accomplish our goal. But briefly, this was a longitudinal study started a little bit over 20 years ago, sponsored by the NIH, where they um, enrolled 6,500 asymptomatic patients with the goal of finding um, predictors of subclinical disease. And, and one of those measurements they made is they took a non-invasive blood pressure waveform and um, measure that in everybody. Then they tracked all these patients and it, the study is still ongoing and we have long-term outcome data and it tracked a number of key cardiovascular diagnoses. Um, just to show you how important this study was, as of November, 2020, there are over 1800 papers have been published uh, from the MESA study. The, the next way we want to, uh, next technology we want to use to um, accomplish our goal is use wearable technology. As, as everybody here knows, um, the wearable uh, revolution has already taken off and we can get a lot of very reliable medical data just, just off of uh, a watch. So for example, we can take our blood pressure from a watch and we can get an EKG. Um, this kind of started when I was a first year fellow and I thought this was gonna be the bane of my existence, just everybody bringing in um, EKG tracings into clinic. And in fact, I find it so useful that I, I ask patients to get these if I think it would be helpful. Um, and, and I find that very high quality signals that, that actually are, are quite useful. Um, so we want to use wearables that can be used to calculate a cardiovascular risk assessment, including a blood pressure waveform independent of a clinic visit. Uh, so unfortunately, this is my Google Fit app. Um, I didn't want to show it mainly because I have achieved zero of seven goals in the last seven days. Um, but the point I wanted to put up here is this is on my phone and it's it's tracking a lot of things about my about my health and it, and it has a number of things that it's actually looking at. And we propose with our solution, we will integrate when current um, fitness trackers uh, and and, and monitor somebody's cardiovascular status. Um, we actually propose as well, because not everybody's gonna have this technology, although it's very widespread, that we're gonna have a buddy mode. So um, I can use a phone, my mom can use a phone, probably not my grandma, but you could imagine where I would come in and say, this is not me, but I wanna assess my grandma to see what her cardiovascular risk is and have her wear my watch and um, get a temporary measurement. So is this actually going to work? Well, we think yes. And, and it sounded like a long shot when we first kind of started this project. Um, but what I'm showing here is 
is a sample uh, participant in the trial. There's a 30 second non-invasively measured blood waveform um, on the left of the screen. And what we did is we transformed it into a power spectrogram. And what we ended up doing was just seeing if we could do something useful with this data. And um, what we did was we, we trained it to recognize um, a participant's uh, uh, sex, and then we tested it. And, and we made this receiver operator curve based on how good of a job it did. And, and as most of you know, a perfect receiver operator curve has an area kind of the curve of 1.0. A coin flip is a 0.5. Is this useful in accomplishing our goal? Absolutely not. But what this does show is that reducing the blood pressure waveform down to two points, you're throwing away a ton of information. So a little more- I think we're, we're at time. So if you wanna just wrap up and then- Yeah, um, this is my last slide, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is the most important slide here. So this is a Kaplan-Meier curve and we took the, uh, um, we, we did this on the MESA trial where we essentially trained on um, a number of patients and then we output scores in a low, medium or high probability where they're gonna develop cardiovascular disease. And then we plotted the longitudinal data and we showed that we can actually divide these patients up into different cardiovascular risks using this measurement. So with that said, I'll thank you and I'll take any questions. Okay, uh, any comments, questions from uh, the judges? Yeah, I guess I missed it. Can, can you explain how you're gonna use the wearable technology to get to this point where you're calculating cardiovascular risk? Cause I, I don't think I caught it, I'm sorry. Yeah, so essentially um, this is an evolving thing and the newest wearables can measure a blood pressure waveform. So essentially what we are doing is developing the algorithm on the MESA data. And once we got that algorithm working, which we're very close to that, what we want to show is that we can replicate those same results um, with the technology used in the MESA trial compared to current wearables. So then we'll have the score. And then the score will out, it'll output a number that'll be translated to low, medium, or high. And that will then become a notification on your phone. Um, because we think if you, um, if you motivate a patient by giving them a notification on their phone, you're really in a high cardiovascular risk group. It'll motivate a, a patient maybe to make higher priorities going to see the doctor um, rather than getting all the other things in life he or she needs to get done. How did you, uh, how, how, what's the onboarding for participants? Like, how are you determining who would be included? And are there any guardrails around or restrictions on any wearables? I mean, are some better than others? Is Apple Health better than Google Health? You know, what are some of the parameters to ensure that, you know, kind of minimize a lot of the noise around, you know, the results that you're getting? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of, dividing this project up into three stages. Stage one is we're working solely with MESA data. So that's already been decided. Um, phase two is to see if we can replicate our results with current wearables so that the main, the main uh, technology is, is the Samsung watch. I wanted to be device agnostic in this presentation, but it's, it's the Samsung one. We anticipate as we you know, time goes on and everything that Apple will probably release a device as well. So, so that'll be phase two. And then after we get all that done, then, then we'll, we'll probably have to do a clinical trial at that point. So we haven't really talked too much about that because we're more focusing on getting the technology working at, at, at this stage. But, um, but your, your point is well taken and we have to think very carefully about that. Hey, this is Shannon. So we know that, um, you know, the frame, the inherent biases of things like the framing hand study and, you know, the CBD's biases towards women have been explored and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So is the idea here to get upstream and to get to more raw data to generate a more um, sensitive 
predictive model that avoids bias? Is, is that how you're gonna address disparities or is there another angle on this? Yeah, there's a couple of things going on here. So, so number one, um, you know, is the, the initial study in and of itself, was it biased? I think probably, but I think it's the best we have right now to accomplish this goal. Um, I think they, they went through a lot, of, um, a lot of safeguards and they thought of it very well. And it's, and it's probably the best that there was in, in the MESA trial. Number two, though, and, and so, so why don't we just do our own trial? You know, I think you, you can't ignore 20 years of follow-up data. Um, I think to get started, we have to use a trial that's already existed. But then you bring up the point of disparities. Um, how are we going to tackle disparities? It's more the final product than the study in and of itself. So with a, 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 a technology like this, you can do everything independent of coming in to, to see a doctor. So if um, somebody has this new technology and they're saying, oh, check out my cardiovascular risk, they can show it to a loved one and say, you know, you don't have to go to the doctor to get your cardiovascular risk. Uh, I know you got a thousand other things to do rather than taking a half day off to go to the clinic. Just try my watch. And then it'll give them an their own cardiovascular risk on kind of the friend mode. And, um, you know, depending on how it looks, they can, they can then use those results to seek care or carry on with their, carry on with their life. Got it. Thank you.